Thank you all for being here today. And a special thank you to our members of parliament who have joined us, um, Craig Scott, David Christofferson, and Alexandrine Latendresse from the NDP, um, Stefan Dion and Scott Sims, and Frank Valierat from the Liberal Party, as well as the leader of the Green Party, Elizabeth May. We did invite Pierre Polyevre from the Conservative Party, but unfortunately we did not hear a response. My name is Adam Shaletsky. I'm a co-founder of LeadNow.ca. LeadNow launched before the 2011 federal election and has since grown to include over 330,000 Canadians. Our mission is to help people across Canada deepen our democracy to create a more open, just, and fair society. Our priorities for campaigning and action are driven by our members' priorities, and we are not affiliated with any political party. We are here today because Canadians across the country, including over 50,000 who signed this petition over the past several weeks, want to be able to participate in creating a new elections law that will impact our fundamental democratic rights. They are outraged that the long-awaited Fair Elections Act, introduced without any consultation with opposition parties or Canadians or Elections Canada, does little to combat real election fraud and instead suppresses the vote of marginalized groups. Let me briefly explain. Following the proven election fraud that happened in a 2011 election, our election watchdog requests that Parliament provide it with the power to compel witness testimony during an investigation, just like the Competitions Bureau can. This was partially because political operatives refused to testify, making it much harder for Elections Canada to get to the bottom of things. Yet this Elections Act does not give them this power, nor does it provide penalties for political parties whose databases are used for unauthorized purposes. The robocall registry and new penalties for impersonating elections officials does not adequately incentivize political parties to protect their databases, nor will they assist Elections Canada in adequately investigating and catching the perpetrators of voter fraud. Minister Polyevra does not appear to have any answers for why our elections watchdog was not provided with the single most important power that they requested. Instead, despite a complete lack of evidence that any actual fraud has occurred with the vouching process that 120,000 Canadians used to vote in 2011, or the use of voter ID cards, the Conservatives have decided to make it harder for Canadians to vote. This effort to increase the complexity of voting requirements is eerily similar to what we've seen happening in the United States over the past decade, where dozens of bills have been introduced and they've had the documented effect of reducing voter turnout by millions of voters. Minister Polly Ever points the Newfeld report for evidence that voter fraud needs to be tackled in Canada. Yet this report does not present one iota of evidence that there is even one case of fraud. Moreover, it makes no recommendation whatsoever to eliminate vouching or the use of voter ID cards. Rather, the report's first recommendation is to widen the use of voter ID cards as a valid piece of address identification because it proved to be very popular in a pilot program in 2011, where 900,000 Canadians participated, and between 36 and 73% of the target communities, which were students, Aboriginal groups, and Aboriginal people, as well as seniors, used voter ID cards when they could, because it's intuitive and it makes sense. If you think about students, students have a student card and they move frequently, so it's not easy to show proof of address. Whereas if they can show their student card and their voter ID card, it's very easy, it's intuitive, it's simple. So people use it. The crisis in Canadian democracy is, is a lack of voter turnout and crisis, in our elect, in crisis of confidence in our electoral system, not fraud by individual voters. It not only does this bill actively suppress the vote, it also appears to prevent Elections Canada from educating our youth on democracy or conducting innovative experiments to increase voter turnout. The reality is that with many Canadians turned off of the political process, and the documented success of nonpartisan voter engagement campaigns abroad, we need to give Elections Canada more resources, not less. We could be having a conversation about bold strategies for increasing participation, possibly mandatory voting or online voting, or placing more polling stations in areas that target lower voting populations. Instead, this law forces Canadians to protect the democratic rights we already have. This bill is fundamental to our democracy. If the Conservative government is serious about improving our democratic process, why are they so afraid about talking about the act in their communities? Why not get people excited about it? Take the act to Canadians and see what people think. Canadians nationwide should be given the time and the opportunity 
to meaningfully participate in the creation of a new elections act that so fundamentally affects our democratic rights. Before turning it over to the opposition parties to make brief statements, I'm going to do an official uh, handoff of the petition of 53,743 uh, Canadians. So maybe we'll do a quick um, photo op and then we can have um, the opposition parties make it. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, quite obviously, this is an amazing accomplishment in a short period of time. It's extraordinarily important uh, that civil society reacts in the way it is. Um, a number of organizations have taken leadership role in uh, expressing a general outrage Canadians are feeling about uh, the Unfair Elections Act. Uh, what I would like to say, I think Adam did an amazing job in summarizing uh, the problems with this bill and the undermining uh, animus of this bill uh, for our democracy. What I would say, finally, is that the fundamental problem of Bill C-23, the Unfair Elections Act, is that the Conservatives have managed to turn ordinary Canadians into the th an imagined threat, an imaginary threat to our democracy. C-23 has turned the truth on its head. They diverted attention from the fundamental problem of organized fraud, such as the Internet scandal in 2006, and the fraudulent robocall scandal of uh, uh, fraud of 2011, and they've turned the lens back on ordinary Canadians. The problem fundamental de, avec euh, le, le projet de loi sur les réformes électorales, c'est que les conservateurs ont, ont traité, ils traitent les Canadiens comme la menace pour la démocratie, au lieu de, de ne focus sur le fait que les partis politiques, les conservateurs, en fait, ont créé le, les menaces pour la démocratie en 2006, 2011, avec euh, les, les, les efforts euh, qui ont fait euh, quelques conservateurs ou euh, le système de l'apparatus euh, conservateur. Donc, euh, I end there by saying that uh, last Thursday at a press conference with my colleague Dave Christofferson, I threw out a challenge to uh, colleagues across the aisle. Uh, I named uh, Michael Chong and Brad Trust as two examples of conservatives who are trying to create the, uh, a little bit of impetus from the conservative side on changing some aspects of a democracy. I do not see how those two inter individuals and anybody else who has the same concerns on the conservative side cannot vote tonight for the opposition day motion to have the Procedure and House Affairs Committee travel across Canada to hear from Canadians about the concerns that Adam so ably uh, outlined. Uh, conservatives have to look themselves in the mirror. This motion tonight is about process. It's about going across Canada. And if they cannot manage to vote for this, boy, we know there's something fundamentally wrong on the other side of the aisle. Thank you very much. Uh, first off, I want to thank uh, Lee now for inviting us. And Adam, thank you very much for the summation. I won't go into details. I think Adam did a very sufficient job. When this all started, the way it started was mysterious, to say the least. The consultations that they had done were of a very select few group, a few people. And what they've done is they've managed to ex manage an exercise in isolation. They want to achieve independence for Elections Canada. And what they've done is they've achieved isolation for an individual who needs more powers. The minister, Minister Polyev, wants to say that he is putting the referee back on the ice, when in fact what he's done, what he's endeavored to do, is he's put the referee on and he took his whistle from him. It's a referee that has no power, and now it's been separated from the base degrees uh, which he came from. Because in Elections Canada right now, there are people fanning across this country to seek out what is wrong with our system and to make it better. And now you have a commissioner that finds himself in a different building with no powers. Even the powers that were asked, asked specifically by that group, were totally ignored. The consultation process is one that is very short-sighted. They only wanted to hear from the people that, that fit into what they wanted to achieve, which was to move Elections Canada away from them. And to essentially, instead of making them neutral, They've now become neutered. So if you, look at, if you look at what they've done and what they talk about, for instance, a countrywide consultation is now considered a gong show. It's a circus. Now, 
when you consult with Canadians, when did you ever think that it was going to turn into a circus or a gong show? It's an exercise in democracy. The problem is that Mr. Polyev only wants to hear from those who give him an A, and he wants to isolate those who give him an F, and not hear from them and marginalize them. And that's an unfortunate part of, of this whole process. Vouching. Why does a Conservative Party choose to throw out the system of vouching based on a few people who commit fraud? Again, what they're doing is they're appealing to the lowest common denominator, when in fact vouching will disenfranchise, vouching does, by getting rid of it, disenfranchise a whole group of people, rural voters, First Nations, students, and many others. The system needs to be fixed. It doesn't need to be thrown out. But that is typical of what's happening here because, again, it is an exercise to isolate the enemies of the Conservative Party. Thank you very much. Je veux ajouter seulement quelques mots parce que le temps presse. Mais c'est clair que on doit euh, redonner la démocratie sa place au Canada. Et ce projet de loi C23, c'est dans la mauvaise direction. It's clear, and I agree with everything my colleagues have said, that we do not have, and I've said it before, we don't have a crisis in Canada of Canadians voting more than once. We have a crisis in Canada of Canadians voting less than once. And this bill will make it more difficult for Canadians to vote. And despite the, um, the, the different forms of ID one can use to listen to debates, particularly yesterday in the House, on the excellent motion from the NDP to take this bill and have public hearings, I heard conservative spokespeople give the impression that you could vote if you were students, if you had your student ID card, or why couldn't you find your birth certificate? You could bring your birth certificate, your student ID card, your transcript, you still couldn't vote. This set of complicated uh, ID requirements that were put in place under Stephen Harper are now worsened under this. I don't blame Pierre Poiliev. The responsibility for this bill rests in PMO. The solution to this bad bill rests in Canadians saying, no way will they accept changing our elections laws on a fast track with restricted debate. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'd like to open the floor for any questions. I, uh, and this is for anyone that can, wants to answer. What uh, <coughs> indication do you have what, whatsoever that the Conservatives would be willing, A, to vote for the motion uh, this evening or take uh, the committee on the road? Okay, it's your motion. Well, right now, uh, we have no indication that the government is prepared to consider uh, any kind of uh, public hearings outside the safety bubble of Ottawa. Uh, originally, as you recall, uh, at committee, uh, the government suggested they might be open to the idea, and we actually started some offline discussions uh, to try to negotiate an agreement to allow us to deal with process, uh, get that in place, and then go on and deal with the substance of the bill. But within three hours of beginning those discussions, the government, uh, the, the Iron Curtain came down from the PMO and those discussions ended. And uh, as uh, to this moment, and I'm about uh, 12 or 13 minutes away from going back to PROC right now to uh, continue my filibuster to uh, demand these public hearings. To date, we have not had an indication that they're prepared to move. Uh, you heard my colleague, Mr. Scott, suggest that uh, we're looking for some of the more uh, interested mem members of the government that uh, who care about democracy, who have made this an issue, uh, and we're hoping that uh, they might stand up in principle tonight uh, and join with us. Uh, it's not about the bill. The motion is not whether the bill is good or bad. We're not at that point. The motion is about calling on this committee to get out of the bubble of Ottawa, to go out into the country where people live and let them point out in very clear terms how this bill is going to disenfranchise them and negatively affect their participation in our democracy. That's all we're asking, but we consider it pretty big. So the pointed question you asked is, is there any, any cracks in, the, in the, the wall from the government? At this point, no, but time will tell. Remember, at the end of the day, in a mature, modern democracy, the highest authority is still the court of public opinion. And that's the one that we're all, all of us here today, are calling on
to put that pressure because that pressure of enough Canadians calling enough backbench government members saying at the very least, allow this bill to get out and see the light of day and to have people comment on it where they live is a basic fundamental right and we're just calling for that right for Canadians. And as it stands right now, we are determined to get those hearings and until we have received some kind of indic indication that the government's prepared to consider them, we stay the course. Well, français. Um, <coughs> Avez-vous des, des, des échos des, des députés d'arrière-ban conservateurs qui seraient peut-être tentés de voter en faveur de votre motion ou de tenter que, que ce comité-là puisse voyager? Pensez-vous vraiment qu'avec les 50 000 noms, vous soyez capable de faire changer un peu le, le poids de la balance? Um, personnellement, je pense que la, la pétition puis le poids de l'opinion publique présentement, euh, je pense que c'est une première étape qui est très importante. Et um, c'est l'idée aussi de pouvoir aller faire les audiences publiques à travers le Canada. C'est de montrer aux conservateurs que ce n'est pas en restant ici dans le sous-sol de l'édifice du centre, puis en, en, en disant que les gens peuvent juste appeler sur Skype, puis ça va être correct comme ça. Ce n'est pas comme ça qu'on fait une vraie consultation, puis qu'on est capable d'aller voir les Canadiens, puis d'aller voir sincèrement qu'est-ce qu'ils en pensent, puis de, de voir sur le terrain euh, de quelle façon ce, ce projet de loi-là va les affecter. Donc, euh, on garde espoir que certains des conservateurs qui ont montré par le passé une plus grande ouverture à la démocratie, puis... Euh, à, à ce genre d'initiatives-là, euh, que peut-être on, on va être capable à la longue de les convaincre. Il y a certaines de leurs propres initiatives qui ont, qui ont réussi à passer grâce à l'appui de l'opposition, donc euh, on garde espoir. Euh, C'est pas un peu de bruit, sachant très bien qu'ultimement, il va rien avoir comme avec Post Canada, comme dans d'autres dossiers, vous avez présenté des pétitions, vous avez présenté des motions. Mais il faut continuer d'essayer. Puis dans ce cas-ci, quand on parle de démocratie, je pense qu'il y en a plusieurs qui sont euh, ouverts, qui, qui, qui voudraient pouvoir nous appuyer. Peut-être qu'à la fin, euh, ils ne le feront pas, mais on va, on va continuer de, de pousser et d'essayer le plus qu'on peut. Mesdames et Messieurs, je, je crois qu'au-delà de la question de savoir si le comité doit voyager ou pas, à notre avis, il devrait, il euh, y a un problème très fondamental qui se pose avec ce projet de loi et le processus que l'on suit. Quand on touche aux règles fondamentales de la démocratie, la tradition au Canada, c'est qu'on a un consensus des partis politiques. Les partis s'opposent sur la direction qu'on doit donner au Canada, mais s'entendent sur les règles fondamentales. Dans ce cas-ci, le gouvernement n'a cure du point de vue des partis d'opposition, ce qui affaiblit tout son processus en termes de légitimité. Alors, euh, bien sûr qu'il faudrait qu'on voyage, mais en plus, il faut blâmer ce gouvernement d'avoir transformé un exercice qui devait être non-partisan en un exercice qui est étroitement partisan. So, if I repeat in English, we think we should travel, meet Canadians about this law that is affecting the basic rules of our democracy, but we also think that it should be, as much as possible, a consensus between parties as it used to be in Canada. So the process is wrong. The Prime Minister is, again, showing a narrow partisan approach about a bill that is affecting the basic rules of our democracy, and he should be blamed for that. Uh, on the uh, a couple of the conservative <laughs> MPs on on Proc, where the uh, you're going later, some of you uh, is are um, have been found to have violated election laws. You know, uh, Ted Opitz uh, donated nine thousand uh, dollars to his own campaign. Blake Richards was fined by CRTC for a rule-breaking uh, robocall. Um, a former uh, uh, conservative MP who sat on the committee. Uh, Dean Del Mastro is facing charges, and he, he was often on there haranguing Mark Mayrand uh, when Mr. Mayrand would come to committee. I wonder if um, the House leadership, the Conservative House leadership's choice of members of Parliament to sit on this committee uh, reflects anything about their attitude towards elections law, in your view. Well, I would add actually two, two examples that uh, make the selection maybe a tiny bit bizarre. Uh, I really don't want to comment on those who've been found in non-compliance with the Elections Act. If they've uh, conformed in the way they were supposed to, that's, um, that's one thing. But we do know that Mr. Butt managed to have certain hallucinations um, recently and tell really interesting tales about, about uh, voter identification cards being scooped up in apartment buildings and somehow used for devious means afterwards only to have him stand in the House and say he somehow misspoke. Uh, he's on the committee. Um, so, 
The second thing is on Mr. Opitz, um, the, the, the ultimate irony of all of this is that uh, he probably would not be sitting in the House if the government's philosophy uh, under this bill were uh, in, in effect in 2011 because it was in Etobicoke Centre where the so-called um, the irregularities took place that are, are being used as part of the justification by the government. And the fact is the irregularities are almost to a, you know, almost every one of them are very, very trivial. Uh, failing to tick a box saying I'm about to administer an oath, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's the funniest thing in the world to be sitting there and seeing um, Mr. Opitz there because the government's own bill might have made it very difficult for him to be sitting there. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting process, put it that way. Based on the examples you just cited, how would things be different under this bill? Well, one thing is Canadians would never know those particular MPs were under investigation, would never have known of, of the charges of elections fraud against, for instance, Dean Del Mastro because they're not concluded. The way C-23 would work, as, and as Scott Sims put it so well, they're not neutering, they're not making the ch chief elector officer more neutral, they're neutering him. They're also silencing him, gagging him, and they're also changing, not only they change the Elections Act through C-23, they also amend the Access to Information Act to ensure that information surrounding investigations of electoral fraud will not be accessible by Canadians under freedom of information uh, processes. So it's also, it's gagging and binding the chief electoral officer. Uh, I don't mind particularly the idea of putting the commissioner for Canada's elections to investigate crime inside the Office of Public Prosecutions. I sure do mind that that person will not have subpoena powers to investigate these things properly. So once again, I mean, Stephen Harper appoints a bunch of thugs to the Senate and then says, see, I told you the Senate's rotten. We've got to, we, we've got to have elected senators. He's going to have committed, or at least in the interests of the Conservative Party, based on the Council of Canadians case, uh, the judge in that case was very clear that the robocalls fraud, while he didn't know who committed those events, trying to send Canadians to the wrong polling stations, that the events that took place were in the interests of the Conservative Party. That's what the court found. And now we're going to have the robocalls issue turned on its head as an excuse to emasculate the office of the chief electoral officer and make it harder for Canadians to vote. We've got to get this out on the road. The gong show is PMO. Public hearings are democracy. And we have to get to committee. So sorry for just very quickly. Mr. Mara, <clears throat> Mr. Mara, just one quick example. Yesterday I did my speech on the motion put forward by the NDP and I spoke about what I spoke here. But I stood up and I talked about examples about how essential IDs such as health cards do, and student cards do not have addresses on them, which is essential. And I listed card after card that do not have addresses. Mr. Butt, who was sitting in the house, yelled out very loudly, why don't you just bring your death certificate? Now that's what we're dealing with. One thing I would like to, to add is that Canadians across the country are aware of who is on the, the committee and they've already donated, several hundred of them have donated to put hard hitting radio ads on the air in the home ridings of conservative members of the House Committee that is studying this bill. And there's a press release that will be in your inbox that will have a, um, a link to the recording of that ad that will begin to roll out over the next several days. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for attending and all of the opposition MPs, thank you very much and um, have a good day.